test, test. How's that? How's everyone feeling today? Yeah? <laughs> Raise your hands if you closed down 3rd Street last night. Ah, nice. Champions. I'm glad you made it here. It's no, I know what I think it's going to get some people to do, but you know what it is? It's a transmission of color graphs. I love that. Ah, uh, this is it. It's a field graph. So we'll connect everything. <laughs> it's like garbage Jenga. What's up? Okay, cool. And time is at 45 or 50? Okay.
we got two minutes. Don't worry, I'm not starting yet. You, you can continue to talk amongst yourselves and socialize for the next two minutes. Um, so I thought I would be, but that looks like it might be dangerous, so. <laughs> okay. It works for me. Yeah, this thing's actually pretty sensitive. So. Maybe less feed or feedback? I don't know what that's called. All right. <clears throat> All right, everyone. So uh, my name is Coleman, and I'm going to be talking to you today about cyber intelligence. Um, hopefully, um, everyone had a lot of fun last night at the uh, concert and everything. So I know I did. Um, so here we go. Um, I'll say that uh, for anybody who wants a copy of this, I actually have it hosted at the URL that's down there. Uh, so if you want to save that. Um, you can actually get a copy of all these slides there. <clears throat> so a little bit about me. Um, I'm a uh, now principal technologist for security operations, GE Aviation, which uh, is basically a technical direction role. So get to do everything from strategic uh, leadership stuff to uh, actually writing code and uh, working on things like malware analysis, you know, contributing to crits, stuff like that. Um, I'm also working on a PhD in computer science at the University of Cincinnati. Um, I am focusing on cyber operations there and there's actually a uh, malware analysis class uh, that I teach there as well from time to time. Um, I came into this job not as a security grad out of college or anything, um, but I actually worked in uh, software performance and failure analysis for a while. Um, did some enterprise software development as well as some embedded software development. So I did stuff from, uh, you know, dig digitizing shop floor operations to uh, fitness equipment and all sorts of stuff like that. Embedded Windows, embedded Linux, lots of fun stuff. Um, I enjoy uh, spending time with my family, who unfortunately couldn't be here this weekend. Um, enjoy looking up cat pics. Uh, who doesn't? Uh, good food, good coffee, good beer. So, <clears throat> so I'll start with, um, you know, a little bit of a, I don't know, some thoughts about what is intelligence, um, because we hear like threat intelligence, cyber intelligence, uh, thrown about a lot. So a uh, book I read recently uh, was actually a really old book written by Alan Dulles, um, who some of you might recognize. Um, <clears throat> he actually puts a quote in there from Sun Tzu um, talking about foreknowledge. Um, and here it is right here. I'm not going to read it off to everyone. Um, but then uh, in the task force on intelligence activities during the second Hoover Commission, uh, which was, I believe, shortly after World War II, um, <clears throat> they actually came up with another kind of more modern definition for intelligence that's strikingly similar to the observations that Sun Tzu had a long time ago. And it again gets to the uh, principle of trying to inform you of everything, or I should say inform your audience of everything that you should know ahead of time prior to initiating a course of action. Um, realistically, you don't get to know everything. 
but it's always trying to chase what more information you can know to make better decisions. And so that's really what intelligence is in a nutshell, is <clears throat> gathering the information together that allows you to make better decisions. So in intelligence, uh, specifically cyber intelligence, we're responsible for collecting and also organizing knowledge. So we're responsible for bringing a lot of this knowledge in, uh, learning from it, uh, and also organizing in a way that allows it to be easily retrievable, um, easily communicated to other uh, members of our audience. We're also responsible for using it to produce actionable and advisory for knowledge. So getting back to the, um, you know, the points that are made right here. <clears throat> that foreknowledge often comes in what I call the form of conclusions, and we'll get to what the word conclusions means in a second. And uh, once you have that, or I should say as you have a process for doing that better, uh, the organization becomes better informed for taking actions that it wouldn't have otherwise been without intelligence. So um, that seems pretty obvious, um, but when I'm talking about intelligence, a large amount of that is generally foreknowledge. And I'll get to how that applies to like the cyber case and everything here in a little bit. So, <clears throat> classic uh, Inigo Montoya mean. Uh, let's define uh, more broadly parts of, uh, parts of the space. So, families of intelligence data, I tend to break these up into two pieces. Um, again, the conclusions, which I mentioned earlier, but also collection, what you gather together. Um, because you don't get to come to any conclusions without actually having data that you've observed in the first place, right? So um, these are just some examples, not a comprehensive list, but I like to think of these two things as uh, you know, almost two different compartments of the like intelligence whole. <clears throat> so the important reason why I like to think about this is because a lot of times we're dealing with, uh, say, uh, things that we consider to be facts. Some of those are things that we have concluded, things that we've observed, a bunch of, say, knowns. So for instance, that light's purple, that one back there's blue. Those are things that I know, those are things that are facts. But a lot of times I may have facts that lead me to certain conclusions. The way I treat those conclusions as facts or not is based upon my confidence level in them. And you want to be able to separate out which, uh, say, uh, parts of your intelligence that you're dealing with uh, that are, say, drawn from conclusions, uh, drawn from, say, your own, your own almost uh, opinions or conclusions from it. So <clears throat> anyway, so I will start off. Um, since I'm in computer science, uh, we deal a lot with, um, say, logic and everything. Uh, the core rules that we're dealing with in intelligence is usually based on inference. So it's in inference and logic, uh, proving theories, that type of stuff. Uh, and many times when we're dealing with, say, how intelligence should be observed or considered in the uh, workplace, a lot of times we're dealing with conclusions that are based on this. So. Um, a implies B. So if condition A is true, then B will also be true. Um, it does not necessarily mean that every time B is true, condition A is as well. Sometimes something else may cause B to be true as well. But I break these up as uh, B is a problem, effect, or symptom. B is the thing that is observed, while A may be a cause. So, um, there may be many causes, some known, some that are unknown uh, to, to say you. So the other thing about this that I will say is that this implies a certain level of certainty about, um, about what your uh, outcomes are going to be. And I will get into the you know, case where uh, that may cause problems here in a little bit. So um, this is the idealized model. I will say that this is not actually how most, uh, how most problems work. So uh, this leads us to what I call inference chains, or what are called inference chains, which is that if I know, say, this fact right here, if I know that A, uh, wherever A is true, then B is also true, uh, if I then also learn 
that every time B is true, some other, say, case, some other um, outcome, C, is also true, I can chain those together and basically say wherever A is true, uh, have the follow through that leads me to conclude that C is true. And so again, I have the, you know, A being the cause, and then there's also a new symptom, uh, C, or a new uh, outcome, C. Um, again, this model implies a certain level of certainty um, that I will argue doesn't entirely exist. Um, a lot of times when we see intelligence reporting and everything like that, uh, that is published uh, in the open source, uh, one of my big gripes with it can often be that there is a, that this model is used there um, to conclude a certain level of certainty about those things. So anyway, uh, the big point here, conclusions are our derived knowledge. So if I look at this right here, I've been given those two pieces at, t at the top as facts, and then I have used my own analysis to conclude that the lower part is true. Uh, so that conclusion that's listed up there is actually my own information, that's my own read on the entire situation. And this is kind of how you, sep or I should say this is an example of separating out the collection that I mentioned earlier, the information that I collected, from what I have concluded, what I have used my own analysis to produce. So, now we'll get into what I call probabilistic inference. Um, probabilistic inference is my own view on how a lot of this implication or inference up here works in the practical world. Um, this gets to the point in the title of my presentation where I said there are no certainties. You can never really be 100% certain of anything. So really our intelligence, our observations that are causing us to draw certain conclusions or have certain, say, outcomes, um, behave more in this way, which is there's a probability that when A is true, B will also be true. So there's a probability um, function that you use to actually describe that uh, relationship between the two, and it's not always a factual amount. Or I should say it's not usually a factual, uh, it's not usually a uh, factual value. So. <clears throat> The important thing here too is uh, that in order to understand what that probability is, we will often have to learn the relationship through observation and recording of our data points. So our conclusions naturally will very frequently be based on historic data. This is the important thing as well. Even trying to use something like this where we're assuming that certain facts are true, they're not true all the time, there's always something new that can come up, that can basically uh, blow it apart. And that's why I always like to think of everything that I know, everything that I've concluded, using a model like this where nothing is certain. So, so quick pop quiz. So I'm gonna have a little bit of audience participation here. Um, so for this piece, I've got two probabilities that cause C to be true here. Or I should say I've got two probabilities that um, C is true in two cases here. So A and B, I'll say the first one A, uh, when A is true 75% of the time, C is also true. And then the second one, when B is true, 85% of the time, C is also true. Those two values have both been measured as likelihood indicators of C. If we find that A and B are both true, what do you think the likelihood that C is true? And uh, I will just give, say, two possible answers here. Uh, raise your hand if you think that if A and B are both true, it makes it even more likely that C is true. Okay? Who here thinks that it makes it, say, less likely than 75% that C is true? All right? So this is a fun exercise because it shows some of the uh, pitfalls of using that kind of like standard um, inference model. So, number one, we always like to think of, uh, say, comparisons or relationships uh, using Venn diagrams, so I kind of did that here, but you very often draw some conclusions about what that is going to look like. So in this case, probabilities are not always additive. So there 
are actually a re there could actually be a relationship between A and B um, that impact your conclusion or impact the truth value of C. So in this case, as you can see, uh, whenever, or I should say, you know, 85% of the time B implies C, 75% of the time A implies C. The interesting thing here is that most of the time that C is true, uh, neither A nor B are true. Uh, the other thing that's interesting that you can draw from this is that whenever B is true and A is also true, then C is not true. And then whenever B is true and A is not true, you have a higher likelihood that C is true. So it's a lot closer to one. So this is a really good, um, I think, exercise in trying to highlight how um, the picture may be different from our initial assumptions just based upon, say, two data points that we've collected. That is evidence of what I would call an information gap, which is we lack the knowledge to know whether or not there is a relationship between A and B that can impact drawing the conclusion C uh, from knowing their, uh, you know, their, the existence of those two values. So I'll jump to the cyber domain now and get out of the broader mathematical logic uh, inference discussion. And we'll go to a little bit more of the practical topics. So breaking down again into uh, knowledge or collections, right? So from that earlier slide and conclusions. So when I'm thinking about how this stuff works in, say, my, my workplace um, or among some of the communities I participate in, um, <clears throat> I usually say knowledge or facts, the things that I collected. Um, so these might be the threat reports that you get or the lists of IOCs or the signatures that you get. Um, those things are all what has been seen, what's being reported to me, um, what did I find when I was doing an investigation? Um, I highlight business operations on here as well as a very interest or important one because knowing what's going on inside of the company you work for or the company that your um, customers may work for is extremely important. It can um, impact, say, the conclusions, which is how to respond. So the conclusions are, say, like signatures. A lot of times what happens and we'll get into some of the frameworks that um, talk uh, that deal with that later, but a lot of times what you end up doing is you'll build signatures based on, say, what's reported in attack reports, uh, but also at most places, you're building signatures that work within your company. So they're both informed by the attack reports, and they're also informed by your business operations. And I found a lot of cases where if I write a signature that, say, works well at my company, I can't just copy paste it over to a friend of mine that works at another company, a lot of times they have to go and tune it themselves and twist it for their own environment. So <clears throat> conclusions are derived from knowledge, just like that example I gave with the signatures. Um, they're tested, uh, so a lot of you may do that. Uh, fidelity testing is one example, and we'll get into that later as well. Um, if they hold up to sufficient testing, so if you do it and uh, say within the signature sense, you end up finding a low false positive rate, uh, then you may choose to deploy it. That's basically it's reached a confidence threshold, uh, a point at which you are confident of the signature. And then you will pretty much at that point treat it in the knowledge base as if it is equal to knowledge, as it is another piece of knowledge. So it's another almost uh, fact to then go and derive more research from in the future. So the important thing here as well, and this is why I like to separate out what are conclusions versus what have you received, is that conclusions that you have drawn can always be refuted in the future uh, by, say, new information that drops that confidence threshold. Um, for example, in the signature case, uh, you may have deployed a signature uh, looking for a certain um, attack uh, that may be compromising WordPress or something, or attempting to compromise WordPress. Um, and a very broad signature just looking for WordPress attempts may work at your company because your company doesn't use WordPress until one day that it does, in which case 
the large-scale deployment of WordPress, a change in your business operations, uh, may impact your signature's fidelity going forward, and you may have to tune it. So that's an example of the research cycle. <clears throat> so now we'll talk about Cyber Intel frameworks. Um, so I, um, there's, a, there's a lot of different ones out there. One of my favorite things about being in the Cyber Intel space is there's a lot of research going into this area. Uh, there's a lot of um, uh, continuous improvement. We'll talk through a handful of the frameworks. But I think my favorite thing is just uh, our, my favorite thing is basically the uh, expectation a lot of times, or um, yeah, the expectation a lot of times by uh, some folks in leadership who can feel that, uh, say, adopting a certain cyber intel framework or something like that is going to be like the silver bullet for a lot of problems. Um, and it's very helpful to try and explain why it is not, uh, why simply replicating that is not going to solve your problem. So many tools exist uh, to assist with organizing knowledge. Um, each of them have their own purposes, so their own functions, um, and also their own limitations. Um, one of the key things that I would always, yes. Oh, jeez. <laughs> All right. It's like, it's like 80 degrees or not, or 95 degrees or something. It's not good. So, all right. Oh, that's terrible. That's absolutely, absolutely terrible. I think I've learned something today. So, anyway, I'm going to set this guy right here. Don't worry, I'll get through it by the end of the presentation. So, <clears throat> one of the key things that I like to try and communicate to folks that ask me about cyber intelligence and everything um, is that <clears throat> someone who goes through and implements all of the models and frameworks that they can find, you know, builds a process around collecting all of that information, um, that doesn't mean necessarily that you have intelligence. Um, additionally, Choosing not to use these. So if you decide to just kind of leave a lot of this by the wayside, you feel it's not for you, does not necessarily indicate that there's a lack of it either. So the big thing here is that I just kind of want to communicate, use a lot of this stuff, um, or I should say use parts of a lot of this stuff that I'll talk about. Um, don't necessarily feel that you need to go and uh, boil the ocean to chase and implement all of this stuff to try and catch up with the cyber intelligence world. Because in my opinion, a lot of people um, who are very successful that I've talked to in the field, um, they, stra or I should say, what makes them very successful is being able to identify what parts of these frameworks and uh, models are useful to their own programs. <clears throat> so everyone's favorite, um, Everyone's fav uh, favorite framework, Sticks and Taxi. Um, it's a structured data exchange format. Um, <clears throat> uh, down at the bottom, I'll just say there's a new 2.0 version that came out that's radically different uh, from how it was structured in the past. I think it's a huge improvement. It's taken a lot of the feedback from the community uh, and changed the schema so that it'll work really well. The idea here is just to have a well-defined computer language, basically, for lack of a better term, I think it's in JSON now, but uh, computer language and schema so that <clears throat> any two people exchanging cyber threat or cyber event information can have a uh, common lang uh almost like a common data model, I guess, is the best way to put it. And so um, this is my first example also of this space is rapidly evolving, rapidly changing. Um, I never really chose to implement the first version of Sticks, and then when version two was released and was a radical change, I was glad that I hadn't, because all of that work, I did not waste. So, um, the other neat thing about this too is you can implement this kind of piecemeal if you want to. So it's very knowledge-centric. Uh, so this one uh, is very uh, focused on trying to build a structured data model 
that attempts to communicate a lot of times a threat report or something like that, and specifically the technical indicators in that. So Cyber Kill Chain, which is a registered trademark of the Lockheed Martin Corporation. I think every time I say that, every time I say the name of this, I think I also have to add that. I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, this is one of the um, older ones. As, uh, this is one of the older ones. Um, it's been around for quite some time. Um, it divides an intrusion up into seven phases. Uh, it does a pretty good job of explaining what each one of those phases are so that if you read a threat document, you can map the different paragraphs in the threat document to each one of the phases. So um, I kind of like it because it's really only like seven pieces. That's actually a, um, you know, a, a high, high enough level of granularity that uh, it's something that is manageable for, uh, for our team. So the other one is Diamond Model, um, which also a really old one as well. Um, I have the PDF of the original like white paper for the thing here. I will say the Lockheed Martin Kill Chain white paper is available on their like marketing site here. <clears throat> so the idea here is that it tries to describe a, a, an event that occurred uh, in terms of four domains. So you will basically have, um, if any of you are familiar with like the um, you know CIA model or something like that from your um, security training or uh, from security books or any of that stuff that you may have taken. It's a similar idea, which is there's a diamond, and then you describe the adversary capability, infrastructure, and victim. And I don't remember which points are which, but basically four points of the diamond are uh, describing those things. And then um, <clears throat> you can use that information to try and uh, document different events. So um, it's an organizational framework. Um, so unlike Sticks and Taxi, uh, which themselves are a computer uh, JSON schema, uh, this is more of an operational framework. It's more of a way of categorizing your information and then defining some high-level metadata. So the other thing that's neat about this one is that since it has been around for a while, there's a large push to try and map, say, new discoveries, new findings uh, into the existing framework versus trying to change the framework on a regular basis to try and meet some of the new uh, findings. So it's mature and relatively static, which can also sometimes make it easy to use in, say, a company where you can't necessarily chase a uh, moving target as easily. So MITRE's attack framework, which is a relatively new one, um, I think it's a very it's a very neat way of attacking the techniques problem, um, which is it basically attempts to be a community-maintained enumeration of common and well-known techniques. Um, I'll see a lot of a lot of companies that are uh, trying to implement this right now. Um, one thing I will say is it's not comprehensive. If you follow the if you follow the development, follow the community, the idea is that it will become say comprehensive with whatever is known up to that point in time. Um, but it's important to just remember that none of us, like not even all of us in the room here, can enumerate every single attack that an adversary does. One of the real cool things that this does do is that, say, back when we were doing, when we were chasing behavioral detection and stuff like that, we started building out our own lists of techniques and tactics and stuff like that. And they were our own lexicon and our own verbiage and even like stuff that was, that we broke into two different techniques. Some peer of ours would actually lump into one common technique because they always saw them chained together. This attempts to solve that intercommunication problem by having a common library, a common standard. But one of the big things for it is also, it's a community. So the community maintains it. And if you're using it, if you're finding stuff that you feel doesn't fit into the framework, contributing that back to the community is extremely important on trying to make sure that we have a, uh, a comprehensive list. <clears throat> so the other thing too that I will say is that of all these, this one can be very um, expensive to try and implement uh, wholesale. Uh, what I would always recommend is trying to identify, number one, don't get scared that you don't have most of it implemented. And number two, try and identify um, improvement iterations you can do to just kind of grow out. So rather than setting a target for yourself of we're going to get everything mapped like 18 months from now, try and say like every month, 
I want to see like two or three techniques that I've mapped to my prevention, I've mapped to my detection, stuff like that. It's also not purely a knowledge base or structure for information exchange. It's, um, it's really like, the, as I said before, a large community library of uh, techniques. Um, it's also changed a lot since I first saw it about a year and a half ago. Um, so it's a, still a moving target today. It's a newer moving target. Uh, back when I first looked into it, they didn't have a pre-attack. They didn't have the threat actor definitions and stuff like that that they have now. But it's a great resource that collects a lot of that information together, again, uh, from a community. So, I promise I will get through it, as terrible as it is. <clears throat> so, all of these frameworks have a lot of utility and often come with an implementation cost. So one thing that I always say, I'm very, um, I'm very big on trying to focus on what you're being asked for, so what your Intel team's being asked for by, say, your broader cybersecurity team, and even by your broader business, and then using that information to drive what you invest in, versus trying to say, oh, I wanna do cyber intel, so here's the 12 things that I just need to put together to do cyber intel and then try and do them to completion. I try and focus on tying what we're gonna do back to some ask or some business need or something like that. I found that is a optimal way to prioritize. So I'm gonna do a few highlights here. Um, Sticks Taxi, uh, one thing that I found, if you're consuming it, it's very easy. There's a lot of existing libraries there that'll allow you to get like structured data uh, in Sticks Taxi, and honestly, it's JSON. To produce it, the cost can be pretty high, and one of the reasons that I found that to be the case is because most of the time, when you are going through a, say, threat report or you're doing incident response at your company or something like that, it can very often be um, be the case that you don't collect all the all the relationships, all the metadata that, say, Sticks uses in order to put together the structured uh, model or the structured representation of an event. So. Uh, that stuff is really bad, by the way. Just <laughs> so it's um, useful if you participate in a high volume information exchange. So if you are working in communities where you are, you know, on a daily basis sharing information back and forth, um, uh, you know, in real time almost, um, or you have some customers that really need that available in real time, uh, implementing the sticks format as a way for you to communicate your data is a, a you're going to be implementing some sort of structured way so you may as well use sticks as a way to uh, to do the structured push of information um, cyber kill chain again the cost was pretty low um, I mentioned that earlier and that's because it is usually just carving up the attack into seven different phases and I've found that a lot of times that helps even just you know most reports, most investigations are written in a timeline format anyways, so it's almost a way for you to break up that timeline into the different phases. Uh, we actually use it a lot to uh, help us target um, where we're deploying detection and prevention at the different phases. So you would be able to detect an attacker within a certain kill chain phase by using the following tools or the following infrastructure that we've, uh, that we've gotten. So um, both diamond model and MITRE ATT&CK, um, a lot more metadata, a lot more data points go into these things. Um, <clears throat> the diamond model ends up being a higher level uh, model of, uh, uh, of adversary techniques and tactics. Uh, MITRE ATT&CK ends up being very fine grained, uh, which is really nice. Um, it's extremely cool to have a library of, uh, and of signatures and of explanations of what different techniques are. Uh, so that you can compare that to what you've been seeing uh, in the wild on your, uh, at your place. So um, what I will say is that um, the, both of these are actually really good to move to after, uh, after you've implemented the cyber kill chain, just because um, you know, that one's pretty easy. And both of them also build off of it. So um, what I will say is what frameworks won't do. Um, here's 
long list of things. I'm not going to recite this slide, but I will say that it has been our experience that in many cases, doing the intelligence work and incorporating these things ends up being a additional thing that we build on top of our existing operations. So it's not, say, saving us any time on the intelligence side. Where we find that it is extremely helpful is answering the questions about prioritizing our security investment on the detection and prevention side, as well as the uh, uh, business side. So if we want to change business operations or something like that to mitigate a threat, um, these can help us organize the information, describe the information, so that we can use that for basically taking any of the actions, any of our conclusions. So remember that because a lot of times there will be an expectation that if you implement, say, sticks or something, all of a sudden you have a lot more time to do intel and everything like that. And I found that it's basically additional work on your intel analysts to accomplish a lot of these things and implement a lot of these things. So we'll jump into David Bianco's pyramid of pain because that is where a lot of the I should say that has been driving a lot of the a lot of these new frameworks. I should say is uh, the goal of trying to identify actors at the top of the pyramid using the uh, TTPs. One thing that I will say uh, that has been wisdom that uh, that we've learned and some of our some of my friends have learned is don't ignore say all the stuff at the bottom of the pyramid just to try and implement the top of the pyramid to implement like behavioral detection. This hits again at the idea that we can never have a whole picture, a complete picture of all the different techniques that are being used in the wild and everything like that. So adversaries job is to come up with new techniques, new tactics, new tools to try and get around everything that we know up to now. And sometimes, very often, we find that they'll end up tipping their hand or leaking, using even all the way down to just reusing a tool with a identical hash as something a year ago um, that they got complacent or whatever after they had found new tactics for getting into the, you know, for getting into a network or something like that. So it becomes very important to get good at collecting and detecting each one of these levels of the pyramid as you work up. And so I like to look at this as a maturity model, which is how much effort and how much collection and how much data in our system is covering each one of these things. And not necessarily a um, let's try and do the thing that seems to be hardest for the adversary because that's also the thing that's uh, most narrowing, uh, that can be the most narrowing approach a lot of times. So some suggestions to get started. Find a knowledge base that your team can manage. I would say um, this is the key one, which is to get out of, uh, say, SharePoint or get out of, uh, say, OneDrive folders and stuff like that. Um, try and get your information into a knowledge base that your team can manage, uh, whether it's something you buy, whether it's something you build, uh, anything like that. The important thing is a database that you can store your facts, your learned knowledge, that type of stuff. Build an event-centric storage model for collecting the incident data. So what that means, uh, I think I actually elaborate on that a little bit later, but um, in a nutshell, that means relating all the information about an event back to that event and using that event itself as a uh, unique ID in your knowledge base. I also say start small. So again, this hits on the don't try and put together a 18-month roadmap of you need to completely implement all these things, but rather identify, say, what are the one or two components of any one of like these frameworks back here? What are like the one or two components of those that you can use to maybe get the best reward or answer the most immediate pressing questions that your team or your customers are needing? Build out what you need as you need it. Again, after you've done, if you're, after you've been able to answer the most pressing questions, what are the next pressing questions? Implement the pieces that will help you answer the next pressing questions. Keep doing that, keep iterating, gradually move up the pyramid, maturing your operations as you grow through that iteration. Recognize that some events 
This is a key piece of wisdom as well that I'll add in here. Um, some events may actually be comprised of multiple attacks or attempts. You may find that many different attacks really are all one big event. Uh, find a way to be able to organize your data in a way that allows that to be represented as well. And finally, don't try to boil the ocean, which honestly is just repeating myself um, and what I said earlier. So um, we'll talk about attribution now. So um, we'll say that attribution, so actor a adversary attribution tends to be a very uh, sexy topic for a lot of, uh, a lot of people. Um, one of the big ones is this, especially some of the um, CrowdStrike reports and stuff like that that came out recently on outing some of the Chinese adversaries um, <clears throat> made a lot of people want to expect those things from their cyber intel teams. So I have right here the photos from the inside of the APT unit's director or director's uh, uh, bedroom as a you know fun thing you know a fun attainable goal and attribution which isn't really all that attainable or even is all that useful. And so. <clears throat> You don't um, attribute uh, indicators or signatures. This is one of the big uh, pitfalls that I've uh, seen from time to time. You really attribute events. So an event was an intrusion done by people. Um, the signatures that detect that event aren't themselves signatures detecting the, uh, the adversary. They just happen to identify techniques that are relatively um, common to that adversary. So. If you use the event-centric model, where you're relating all the observations and all the artifacts and everything like that back to the event, you can actually do simple relational comparisons between events to see, say, how many signatures um, were, you know, how many signatures were similar across different events, or how many indicators were similar across different events. As you mature up the pyramid, and this is the key thing, this is why I say don't discard all the stuff below the pyramid. As you get further up and you start to identify tools, then those are new data points that can highlight even more possible relationships. And then as you get to TTPs, that's another set of data points. And suddenly you have more that you can use to try and answer those attribution, actor, campaign questions. <clears throat> the other piece that all I had is that rarely are you gonna be able to attribute an event within like 24 hours of the event. That's just a very unrealistic expectation and it's fraught with, say, if you are pushing to do that, it's fraught with uh, mistakes and misattribution. Um, I'm not gonna talk any more about attribution, but I will give a quick shout out to Florian Roth wrote a really good blog post once on the newcom newcom Newcomer's Guide to Cyber Threat Actor Naming um, that I recommend everyone here reads because it reflected a lot of my own uh, observations and. Uh, experiential learning on the topic. So the other thing that I will say is not everyone needs to do cyber attribution. Going back to this, whether something is malicious or bad, right, whether it's malicious or good, sorry, whether it's malicious or good, is usually sufficient for 80% of organizations. So trying to get down here, you know, the rest of them pretty much the two boxes here and then nobody really needs the box down there except for law enforcement, right? So. Use this only as much as you really need it in your organization. You don't need to go crazy with it. And then also recognize that not everyone's conclusions will match. Just because I think something is attributed to fuzzy snuggly duck doesn't necessarily mean that someone else who maybe disagrees with that opinion is wrong. Um, it could be that they see something different. And also that's a piece that uh, the blog link there uh, talks about as well. So knowledge gaps. Knowledge gaps, again, the questions your organization is asking you should help drive a lot of the collection and research efforts that you're doing. So you shouldn't be trying to willy-nilly run out there and try and investigate things or do research that seems to be like academically interesting and everything like that. You should always be trying to pulse your organization your, um, say, not just your cybersecurity team, but also your business teams that themselves are trying to be more secure. You should be having this constant dialogue with them to try and figure out what you should be researching. 
on a weekly basis if possible because that will help you prioritize a lot of your Intel research efforts. Um, social engagement is like the key thing here. Social engagement beyond just your information security team is key and is necessary in figuring out how to say most, say how to apply your resources in the most effective way possible because we all work with, you know, with uh, limited resources. And so um, I give one example here, lack of detection coverage. So I'm given a malware sample. I run that malware sample mm -hmm. in a sandbox. I look at the, um, I look at the PCAP that comes out of it and determine that none of my snort rules can detect it. That itself is an example of a type of knowledge gap. <clears throat> However, there are a lot of other knowledge gaps and I'm kind of relating this as this is a very kind of well-known, well, uh, you know, very relatable one for a lot of people in information security. Um, this may or may not be so relatable depending on what your job is, but these are equally, uh, equally good examples of knowledge gaps. And you should start thinking about answering questions like this. Um, you know, what research you would do in order to answer questions like this and how you can actually communicate that research action or that research project to uh, Intel analysts. <clears throat> so, uh, action-driven intelligence. So this gets to the, um, once you've identified the gaps, you want to find out, so the gaps will tell you what is the company wanting to do, what is the company wanting to change. Uh, when doing research, whether it's malware analysis, infrastructure mapping, anything like that, you want to try and come up with some sort of idea of after you know something to be true or after you have learned something about a piece of malware, what is going to be done with that information? How is that going to change your operations? I would say that, again, to hit at the prioritization piece, if you cannot define that, if you don't know that, ask, socialize among the team, and if you still can't identify that, maybe that research effort is something that shouldn't be prioritized over a lot of others. So you're always gonna have a lot more leads than resources. So it's important to try to do these internal exercises to figure out how to prioritize and focus that research. <clears throat> and so managing cyber intelligence, this gets back to the knowledge base piece. I like to separate knowledge base into two components one of which is structured observations and artifacts or databases. The other one is unstructured narrative. So don't overlook the value of this. It can be very uh, attractive to you because a lot of times it requires a separate knowledge management tool for that. Um, but don't overlook this. Being able to draft up narrative documentation in something like uh, MediaWiki is a popular one that even um, you know, MITRE's attack team uses on the, on the attack website. Um, but a lot of other uh, companies use it because it scales really well. It's very popular and almost everyone who's a programmer has uh, edited a Wikipedia article. So they're familiar with the syntax and everything. Uh, the key thing here too that I'll add is that if you're documenting stuff in a unstructured system like that, make sure that you're mapping consistently across systems. So if I go in and I see an IP address in my MISP system, that IP address when I look at that entry, it should tell me where to find all of the documents in my unstructured system that reference and explain why that IP address is bad, explain how we got to the conclusion of we should block this IP address. So, and that's what the unstructured narrative is for because I'll be honest, I have not, I've looked at a lot of these, I have not seen any of the structured systems that have a uh, comprehensive enough or capable enough um, narrative engine to be able to do this a lot better than actually just maintaining a separate one yourself, which ends up having two systems. Um, getting to one console to rule them all can be a real fun um, thought exercise, but in practice, uh, we don't really see it. Uh, so we end up building a system a lot more like this. So detection deployment is a hypothesis. So we'll get to this hypothesis testing and all that stuff. So when you deploy a signature, you don't know how it's going to behave in the future because that's not how time works. Uh, you can only gather how it's going to, how it's likely to behave in the future as a function of 
how it has behaved in the past or how it has behaved on data, uh, historic data that you've collected up to now. Uh, that hypothesis needs constant testing. So after you deploy something, you still want to have a mechanism for testing the hypothesis and making sure that you can, um, you know, that say if it's no longer good detection, that you can remove it and you have the data to support that. Uh, recognize also that there are always some attacks you are missing. So just because you've implemented everything, again, hitting on the um, frameworks are not comprehensive, the list of TTPs is not comprehensive, the list of threat actors is not comprehensive. There's always some attack out there that you're going to miss. So don't stress over having partial coverage. Just focus on trying to iterate and have a little bit more coverage tomorrow than you do today. So hypothesis testing, I will jump through this really quick. We do what I like to call fidelity testing, which is basically when I get an alert, I want all of the data structure, all of the GUIDs, all the identifiers that built that alert, that caused that alert to fire, so all the indicators, signatures, et cetera, I want, that st I want to be able to count the percentage of those that caused FPs versus true positives so that at any time, at a moment's notice, I can actually compute what is a good versus a bad uh, signature or indicator. So we'll go to uh, automation and I'm going to rush through this very quickly, but uh, I'll say that automate early, automate often. We're all very resource constrained, so find ways to automate your operations. And the first step to automating operations is to do them manually and then figure out how to do them manually in a very consistent manner. Because once you've built in consistency, then you can build in, or I should say you can just tell a computer how to do it in a sequence of steps at that point, which gets you to automation. And good and bad intelligence. Um, just leave this up here. Um, oftentimes, someone asks me whether something's good or bad, uh, if, if I have a list of IPs, something like that. I can never tell you if a signature is going to be good in your environment. You need information about your environment to answer that question. That gets back to the collection requirements, the knowledge that you need to know. Um, so a lot of times when you're asking whether it's uh, good or bad, and you're really wanting to know is this going to be a high or low fidelity uh, detection in my environment, this is a lot of times my initial answer, which is figure out how to get all the events uh, in your environment that can actually provide that information to you, and then work that test into your initial deployment hypothesis. That can cause you to have much better initial deployment de uh, decisions uh, than, say, you did without that information. Um, so, for instance, archiving logs, archiving some PCAP data, stuff like that. Um, it's a little bit more expensive, but it might be cheaper in the long run. And I will, I just had uh, the review right there. So, I'll leave these up here so the video can get them. Uh, I've talked through every single one of these about three times. And end of presentation. So. so I will linger around for a bit if anybody does have any questions. So 